Okay, hello, I am Andrew Lewis Pye. I'm from the London School of Economics. I'm going to be talking about joint work with Tim Roughgarden from Columbia University. The topic of our presentation is blockchain security and the way in which security is impacted by basic design choices, such as whether the protocol is proof of work or proof of stake. Uh, we're focused here on permissionless blockchains. Okay, so those are blockchains like Bitcoin that anybody can participate in with as many identities as they like. If you're running a permissionless blockchain, then you have to be able to deal with uh, civil attacks. Right? So that means you have to be able to deal with a, a malicious user, an adversary who tries to cause trouble by uh, running a large number of identities. And generally, the way this is done is by having a user's participation be dictated uh, not by the number of identities they, they use, right? but rather by their access to some scarce resource. So if you're running a proof of work protocol, then a user's level of participation will be dictated by their hash rate. Right? If you're running a proof of state protocol, then it'll be your, your currency balance that matters. If it's a proof of space protocol, then it's your access to memory capacity. So you have some method of user selection, which is dictated by access to a scarce resource. Okay, and then the basic question is this, are there fundamental ways in which the method of user selection impacts security. Okay, so it can be proved, for example, that proof of state protocols can be secure against unbounded network partitions, while proof of work protocols never can be. Okay, and in fact, we'll, we'll see later on that, yes, we can, that's something we can prove. Okay, so here we're gonna be focusing on a particular aspect of security, which is what we'll, the production of what we'll call certificates. So certificates are sets of messages uh, whose existence provides incontrovertible proof of block confirmation. Okay, so Bitcoin doesn't produce certificates because the existence of a, a certain chain doesn't prove that it couldn't exist a different and uh, longer uh, incompatible chain. On the other hand, uh, most BFT style protocols have implemented in the permission and setting using proof of stake, they will produce certificates. Okay, so Algorand, for example, Algorand produces certificates. In Algorand, if you see, if you see a, a chain of blocks with all the relevant votes for the blocks in that chain, then you can know that all the blocks in that chain are confirmed. Okay, but is this really uh, a matter of BFT versus longest chain, or is there something deeper going on here in terms of the, the method of user selection? Uh, so that's what we're going to be analysing, uh, and we'll see a, a precise definition of certificates later on. If you want a, a simple take-home headline from this talk, it's this. Okay, so proof-of-work protocols can't produce certificates, while any proof-of-state protocol either produces certificates or could be recalibrated or tweaked to do so. Okay, what we really mean there is, so if you take any proof-of-state protocol, uh, you can, if you, if you choose the right notion of confirmation, then it will produce certificates. Okay, so that's the sort of simple summary. Uh, so what I'm going to do the rest of the talk is to give four results that make those ideas precise. And in fact, the, the results we give are going to be more general than that, more general in the sense that they, they don't just apply to proof of work or proof of, proof of stake protocols. They apply to permissionless uh, blockchain protocols in, in, a, in a more general sense. Okay, obviously, if we're going to get uh, theoretical impossibility results of the type I'm going to be talking about, in this presentation, then we need a general framework for talking about permissionless blockchain protocols. Okay, there are, there are established uh, frameworks for talking about proof of work protocols, but those frameworks don't suffice to, to simultaneously deal with proof of stake protocols. Okay, so in order to get these results, uh, the first thing we need to do is to establish a general framework for talking about uh, proof of work, proof of stake, proof of space protocols, and so on. And then once we have such a framework, we can, we can give theoretical results establishing the extent to which today's protocols have to look the way they are, right? given the security guarantees they achieve. Okay, and some of those results might already be intuitively known uh, by, by the community and in some way be. Either way, we'd argue that formal analysis of this type are relevant to the community for, for several reasons. So first of all, accurate intuitions of the community can be formally validated with the necessary assumptions clearly spelled out. Right? And we'll see uh, a useful example of that later on. 
inaccurate intuitions can be exposed as such. Unexplored areas of the protocol design space can naturally rise to the surface. Again, we'll see an example of that later on in terms of the recalibration protocols to produce certificates. Then, and lastly, new definitions can enhance our language for crisply describing and pairing competing solutions. And again, we'll see an example of that in terms of our formulation of the certificates. Yeah, I think it goes without saying that uh, formal analysis of this kind have played a, a really pivotal role in developing the theory for permissioned uh, consensus, consensus protocols. So now we want to do the same for the permissionless case. Okay, so uh, let's go on to discuss, uh, to briefly sketch the, the framework. Right? So I'm going to skip the details, I'll just give the, the basic essentials. Okay, so we consider uh, protocols which run relative to a, a resource pool. Okay, so this is a function which assigns a resource balance to each user over the protocol execution. And its most general form, the resource pool is it's a function R that assigns a resource balance, it's some real number, to each user at each time slot and possibly relative to a given message state. Well, you can think of the message state as being a set of messages that's been, been received by a given user. Okay, so the resource pool just assigns a resource balance to each user at each time slot, possibly relative to a, a given message state. So if we're dealing with a proof of work protocol here, obviously the, the resource balance will be a user's hash rate. Okay, and this will be independent of the message state. You just have a hash rate at each time slot. If we're talking about a proof of state protocol, when the resource, then the resource balance could depend both on the, the time slot and the message state. Okay, and then uh, so users make requests, okay, to broadcast messages, okay, uh, <coughs> such as lots of transactions, and the chance of these requests uh, working will, will generally depend upon a user's resource balance. Okay, and then there are, there are various uh, other differences with standard proof of work protocol uh, frameworks, which I won't go into here. Here, though, is a, uh, a definition which is important for everything else that's coming up. Okay, we say we work in the size setting if the resource pool is given as a protocol input. Okay, we know the resource pool from the start of the protocol execution. Okay, so now with, with, with proof of state protocols, we do know in advance how the resource balance of a user depends upon the, the set of messages, right? I am set of confirmed blocks. Okay? But we know that from the start of the protocol execution. So this means we're working in the size setting. That doesn't mean we know in advance uh, which user is going to be uh, have lots of currency uh, during the course of the protocol execution, right? Because we don't know in advance which blocks of, uh, uh, of uh, transactions are going to be confirmed. Okay. Okay, but we. We do know what the resource pool is as a function from the start of the protocol execution, and that means we're working in the size setting. With proof of work protocols, we don't know in advance how a user's hash rate will vary over time, because okay, so there we're working in the unsized setting. Okay, and then the protocol is just a set of instructions to be carried out by uh, non faulty processors. Okay, then we also consider a notion of confirmation, okay, which takes any set of received messages. Okay, and generally, these messages could be of any, could be of any form, okay, but some of them might be blocks of transactions. Okay, it takes any set of messages uh, and returns a set of confirmed blocks. Okay, so the, the notion of confirmation is the function that tells you when blocks are confirmed. Okay, so obviously, with, with Bitcoin, this function takes any set of blocks and it returns uh, those blocks which are at least k deep in the, in the longest chain amongst that set of blocks. Okay, so note, note here that generally uh, different users will have different M's, right? They might receive different sets of messages. So different blocks might look confirmed uh, from the point of view of different users. Okay, and it's, it's important here that we think of the notion of confirmation as at least potentially being separate from the protocol. Okay, so the protocol tells you how to interact in sending messages, such as blocks of transactions, how to go about building uh, chains of blocks and so on. And then the notion of confirmation is separate from that and tells you when blocks are confirmed. Okay, so with Bitcoin, for example, you could consider a block confirmed when it's followed by six blocks. You could consider it confirmed when it's followed by 10 blocks. Okay, but that, that doesn't change how you, how you go about building the blockchain. 
case of notion confirmation is, is uh, separate. Okay, then an input uh, to the protocol, one of the inputs is the uh, security parameter epsilon, okay, which you can think of as, as bounding the probability of there being an error as we're carrying out the protocol. We say a protocol is secure if the probability of two incompatible blocks being confirmed is less than epsilon. Okay, and then here's a definition of liveness. I won't give the precise definition here. It's just a rough definition. So a protocol is live if the number of confirmed blocks can be relied on to grow over time. Okay, so uh, next then let's see the definition of certificates. Before I give the actual definition, uh, let's give a definition which is two weeks, first of all, so I'll properly explain the actual one. Okay, so if B, block B is confirmed with respect to a set of messages M, right, I of B is in C of M, then we'll call M a subjective certificate for B. The problem with that, uh, as, a, as a notion of certificates, is that if, if M is a subject, subjective certificate for B, well, there might exist some larger set M prime such that B doesn't look confirmed with respect to M prime, right? Okay, so we're in Bitcoin here, M could be a chain of blocks, M prime could be a larger set that in chain, in, includes that chain, but also includes a, a different, a longer, uh, and incompatible chain. Okay, so the M being broadcast isn't proof that B is confirmed with respect to M user. Okay, so then here's the, uh, the actual definition. So we'll say a protocol with notion of confirmation C produces certificates following holes of probability greater than 1 minus epsilon and the protocol is run with security parameter epsilon. Okay, so two users will never confirm conflicting, uh, conflicting blocks whatever subsets in the total set of broadcasted messages they receive. Okay. okay so the definition is saying that from amongst all the broadcast messages you can't pull out two sets of messages that make incompatible blocks that look confirmed. Okay, so the basic idea is if a protocol produces certificates then subjective certificates constitute a uh, proof of confirmation. Okay, so Algorand is an example of a protocol which produces certificates. Okay, the protocol is designed so that it's unlikely that two incompatible blocks uh, will ever be produced together with you know, appropriate committee signatures verifying confirmation for each. Okay, and this, this is obviously this is a definition which is pretty clearly false uh, for protocols, so long as they're using a, a longest chain uh, notion of confirmation, right? So as long as some incompatible chains are being produced. Okay, and then we're, we're almost ready to, uh, to state our results now. We just need a couple more basic definitions. Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of different assumptions we can make in terms of the reliability of communication. And these, these two uh, different possibilities here are just uh, completely standard versions from the distributed computing uh, literature. So first of all, in, in a synchronous setting, we assume there's a known upper bound on how long messages take to be delivered. Okay, so that's simple. In the partially synchronous setting, okay, we allow then that there might be unbounded network partitions, right, during which time uh, messages may take any amount of time to be delivered. Okay, so this upper bound doesn't always apply, but we only require liveness during periods of synchrony, okay, during sufficiently long periods of synchrony, so i.e. when message delivery is reliable. Okay, so now let's get into results. Um, so first of all, let's consider the, the partially synchronous setting, right? So as I just said, that's the setting in which there may be unbounded network partitions. Okay, so there, there are two results I want to mention here in, in, in this setting. So the first is, is this one, right? The protocols can't be both live and secure in the partially synchronous and undersized setting. Okay, so if we're working with something like a proof of work protocol, where the resource pool is not given as a protocol input, okay, that is not possible for a blockchain protocol to function. Now, it's intuitively obvious here that Bitcoin isn't secure in a partially synchronous setting. Right? So, if the two sides of a partition uh, continue to grow, obviously the shorter one will be thrown out once the, once the partition ends. The point here is that this isn't specific to Bitcoin or even to longest chain protocols. Right? This is driven fundamentally by the, the proof of work approach 
to see if I lose this point. Okay, so uh, proof of work protocols can't function in the partial synchronous setting. Okay, so far we haven't talked about certificates though, so why are they relevant? Well, certificates are certainly a sufficient condition for security in the partially synchronous setting, right? And they're, they're, they're the method by which Algorand, Tendermint, and all the protocols we know that work in the, in the partially synchronous setting, that's how they achieve security. Okay, what we achieve, what, what we care about, though, is the, is the security, right? Rather than the certificates. Certificates are just a means to an end. So the question here is, are we, are we missing uh, an important part of the design space, right? Is there some other way to achieve security in the partially synchronous setting? Okay, so the next theorem here says, says no. Right, certificates are not only sufficient for security in the partially synchronous setting, they're also necessary. Okay, so our new definition, the definition of certificates, allows us to succinctly state what protocols that are secure in the partially synchronous setting that they have to work well. Okay, so, so summing up the two previous results, then, so basically unsized won't work in the partially synchronous setting, and all size protocols that work will produce certificates. Okay, so now let's move on to the synchronous setting. This is where message delivery is reliable, where we have this, this no and upper bound on how long messages take to be delivered. So we know that Bitcoin doesn't produce certificates, but it is secure in the, in the synchronous setting. Okay, so the next question is, can proof of work protocols produce certificates in this setting, in the synchronous setting? And the next two theorems say that proof of work protocols can't produce certificates. Okay, but modulo certain basic assumptions, all proof of stake protocols can be made to produce certificates by choosing the right notion of confirmation. Okay, so here's the first, uh, the last two theorems. Okay, so consider the synchronous and unsigned setting. If a protocol is live, then in the presence of a non-trivial adversary, it does not produce certificates. Okay, so the adversary being non-trivial here just means that it has some non-zero resource balance so that it can actually could contribute to the, to the protocol. Okay, so in particular then, proof of work protocols do not produce certificates. Okay, and then here's our, our final theorem, which I'll just state informally here. So consider a, a permissionless blockchain protocol that operates in the synchronous and size settings. Then there exists a recalibration of the protocol which produces certificates. Okay, so a protocol being a recalibration of another here basically just means it's, it's the same protocol, but we use it a different notion of confirmation. Okay, so in particular, if we consider proof of stake protocols in the synchronous setting, okay, then we know that some recalibration of the protocol will produce certificates. Right? So even if we consider a, a longest chain protocol like Snow White, we can adjust the notion of confirmation away from being a longest chain rule. So the, the, the protocol produces certificates. Okay, so it's worth pointing out here, uh, like with, with, with that example, our research program has led us naturally to explore a non-standard part of the blockchain design space here, in terms of the longest chain protocols that we made uh, to produce certificates. And this is a good thing, right, because we want to understand the design space as generally as possible, not just through a handful of specific protocols. Okay, so I will stop there. Thanks very much for listening.